Welcome to The Thriving Marriage, the podcast for those who want to get their spouse back in love with them and truly thrive. You'll learn why 95% of people don't save their marriage and the secret method no one else is talking about that will change everything for you. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's, Let's turn, turn tragedy, tragedy to, to triumph. triumph. Here are your hosts, international marriage experts, Mark Johnston and Heather Choate. All right. Welcome everyone here to The Thriving Marriage. I'm Heather Choate with Mark Johnston. We're excited and grateful that you guys are here. Hope you're having a beautiful fall day wherever you are in this beautiful world. How are you doing today, Mark? I am doing awesome. I love this season. This is like my favorite kind of weather. So I am excited to get out a little bit later with my family and enjoy the fall season. Just in general. Yeah. The weather. I love it too. Um, here in Colorado, the part where I'm at can get pretty toasty in the summer. It's pretty arid and can get, you know, 90s, 100s most days. And so to have the cooler weather is awesome. And I love to be able to go up to the mountains and see the aspen trees changing color. So we're going to do that here in a little few days too. So yeah, hopefully wherever you are, it's beautiful and refreshing and yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it's a beautiful time of year. So today we're going to be talking about how to navigate challenges of different life stages in marriage. This is a topic again that you guys had requested over in the Thriving Marriage Facebook group. And we got some of your comments and some of the challenges that you all have been experiencing as you've been going through different life stages. And we're going to show how to navigate those successfully, what works and what most people do that really just doesn't work. Before we get to that, though, we're going to share our client win of the week. This one comes from Sarah. Mark, you want to share this one? Yeah, Sarah shares that it's been two weeks since she's put, but she thinks that her husband and her are back on track. She says, we've had many wins and then a little bit of pullback on his part. But what I learned from this course, I was very patient and kind and understanding to my husband. This week, he's been very complimentary uh, towards me and a little more open as to where he's going. He's been very open about a few things that he would normally leave me in the dark about, which is so nice to hear him talk about. She goes on further and says, Friday night, he took the kids over to his parents' house for his dad's birthday. And before they left, he sent the kids outside and hugged me and said that he's sorry that I wasn't able to come as birthdays are special to me. After a very long hug, he stood there and looked at me as though he wanted to lean in and kiss. This moment, I'm sure, was short, but seemed to last forever. I haven't felt this month that much intensity from him in a very long time. Since then, he's been great. We watched a movie last together last night, shared a bottle of wine, he made jokes, we laughed, and at every moment he would try and touch my hand when he could. Long way to go, but I'm happy with the process. Falling in love all over him feels great. I love that. So, yeah, yeah, definitely like, making progress there. Yeah, what Sarah's sharing here, like I, I wanna point out, it's not, I think some people go into this and think, okay, like I, I'm gonna I'm gonna fix my marriage, and at this point, it's it's fixed, right? Mm-hmm. As in, like there's like a like a turning point, or there's like a magic moment when everything's good. Well, what I like uh, with Sarah's share here is that she's she's noticing that this is a process. And like she's noticing that her husband is drawing back into the marriage and is engaging with her and drawing closer to her, even though she kind of recognizes that it's not exactly where she wants it to be quite yet. Uh, This is always like a kind of a happy thing for me to see because, you know, when we can start seeing the momentum going in a positive direction, relationships tend to keep, keep their momentum, essentially. So, you know, it's great to hear Sarah share this. Yeah, and for all those who are listening, even if your spouse is like checked out right now, even if they're having an affair, multiple affairs, broken trust issues, I'd really love to hear if you would love to experience what Sarah here has experienced. Because it's not uncommon, I remember when Sarah first joined with us, that things were really, really tense with her husband, everything was turning into an argument, and then the pulling away, all of that dynamic going on there, and that's where most people start. And so... If that's you, know that you can do this. Just like Sarah was like, I don't know if I can do this, but I need to try it. And found out that the process was a lot simpler than she realized. There was just doing some really core things consistently that we helped her do and walking her through it 
got her to this point now where they truly are falling back in love, which is a beautiful thing. So for those listening live, I'd love to hear your comments. If you would love to get to where Sarah is, even if things are pretty tense or rough or even seem hopeless right now, because most people start there. So Mark, I know you've been married a good number of years. I've been married. I thought it was, I thought we were going on 17. We're actually going on 16 years. <laughs> it's one of those things that we're, as we're getting older, it's like, was it, uh, I can't do math and I can't remember anything, even like my kids' names or how old I am. So we're going on 16 years. I know you've been married. Um, yeah, we just, we just hit 16 ourselves. I had to remind my wife. She was telling someone 15 years and I had to correct her on that one. But yes, I sometimes I have to think about it. I'm like, I know the year I was married. Let's do the math. Let's see. It's, okay, 16 this, this time around. Yes. So between us, like when there are different marriages, you know, we have a good amount of experience. And we, though we haven't been married, you know, 40 or 50 years yet, we have seen some different life stages ourselves. And we're going to talk about some of the kind of the arc of a relationship, the common arc that we see, um, as well as the ones that we've experienced as far as like honeymoon, newlywed stage, you know, going into being new parents, newborns, toddlers, uh, raising children at those ages, you know, getting deep into careers and now having teenagers. And then, you know, we coach, most of our clients tend to be 40s, 50s. They, you know, they're getting to the place where they're empty nesters, kids are leaving the house. You know, we even coach some 60 year olds. I was talking to a sweet little 82 year old lady the other day uh, who'd been married 52 years and was like, my husband doesn't talk to me. <laughs> so, you know, we've seen the whole gamut here um, in our coaching and helping tens of thousands of people around the world. So before we dive into the common arc, I just wanted to visit some of the comments over in the Thriving Marriage group where we asked you, if you feel like different life stages has affected your marriage and has it made it more challenging, yes or no? And then what are these life stages that make your marriage challenging? And some of you guys shared, you know, that you've been through a lot of different stages here and that, you know, having adult kids live with you, grandkids, never have time alone with my spouse, now we're separated, fighting for my marriage and to get our kids to move out, it's our time, is what one person said here kids growing up, how to discipline them, um, facing physical mental health issues. Several people talked about mental health issues um, and physical challenges as well. Um, as you guys know, um, in my marriage, we've faced some, some pretty extreme health challenges and, and life challenges and life adversity that came up. And that's just what happens in the course of life, right? Um, having kids, having kids grow up, become adults, owning a business, having a financial downturn, health issues, so many things can. I uh, like what can, uh, Candid, can, Candace sorry, said here, the trick is to fight back to back against your issues rather than face to face against each other, which is a really beautiful thing. Um, a lot of people talked about kids. So that's what you guys have said, that these different life stages have presented different challenges for you. I know that a huge one, and we'll probably talk about this as well, is the midlife crisis. That's a mm -hmm. huge defining point in many people's lives. It's not like it's guaranteed that everyone's going to go through a midlife crisis, but there tends to be this time between the ages of 30 and 50 when you're like, okay, I'm tired of doing the same things I've always done. And then we see people take that in a lot of different directions and usually some pretty unhealthy ones. And that leaves the partner that's wanting things to work like, what do I do here? My spouse totally just changed everything on us and is doing all of these wild things. And so where does that leave me? What can we even do about this? And it can tend to be really scary and really heavy. So Mark, working with so many clients and having such a broad perspective, I think is such a gift because so many of us, we only know what we know in our own experience, which makes us a little myopic, right? We only see what's right in front of us. And the beauty of being a marriage expert like you are, is that you get to see such a broader perspective here. You get to see like a 30,000 foot view of so many people's experiences and coaching them and guiding them on how to successfully navigate through these things. 
So I'm grateful that we get to talk to you and I think everyone else should really pay attention here because it's not every day you get to talk to someone that's had this uh, much experience helping so many people at so many different life stages. So with that all being said, what do you feel like, Mark, that you've seen are some overarching like different phases that most marriages go through and most couples experience? So what I've what I've noticed is that there there are some distinct stages. Um, you know, as I thought about this and as I was preparing for today, you know, I, I noticed a lot of different people had different names for the, these different stages. But in general, a lot of these are basically, you know, challenges to overcome or opportunities to draw close that are very common um, with just about any couple. And I, I think we, many of us are aware of these stages. Like a lot of people are kind of just sort of like, they, they see it either in their own relationship or in other relationships. And it's fairly common now. I don't think anything like, you know, in terms of really nailing down what the stages are, it's going to be terribly surprising. But I want to make sure that we're all like kind of on the same page here. Uh, so I think we're all very familiar with like the honeymoon phase here. Yeah, I don't know how things were with you and Ben, but you know, I we certainly had that in my marriage, and uh, you know, for those first several uh, years, it was very much about high amounts of romance, passion. There's high amounts of sexual intimacy, infatuation, just like really, really focused on each other, and we see this all all the time. Like newlyweds, you can sometimes just you recognize that they're newlyweds how, because of how they act around each other, or even just people who are in new relationships. I know a lot of times we talk about, um, you know, even in with infidelity or affairs, we talk about how the person is in limerence, and it's really hard to see any of the faults uh, in, in these new relationships because they're exciting and all of that. Uh, and this is a, it's useful in a romantic relationship that you're trying to build up because this is one of those drawing in points. This is where like you're really building up how much you actually like each other. It's needed in new relationships. And this tends to go um, for, you know, a few months up to a few years is, is typical. Uh, almost invariably though, we go into a, an adjustment phase where real world responsibilities start to pull the couple back down to earth. Uh, they need to adjust to the realization that Maybe their partner has some imperfections. Maybe I don't know. Like, maybe your your relationship is a little bit different, and maybe your partner didn't or doesn't. You know, I most most of the time, if people are here listening to us, they they're, they've already recognized those imperfections. But it's it's a time to adjust and work uh, work through those some of those problems as some of those imperfections come to light. Uh, this phase right here, uh, it's, it's kind of like a transition phase, uh, and it goes into where we start to actually see the, the majority of divorces. Like, you've heard of this, uh, Heather, the seven-year itch. Yes. Uh, I've also heard it called the great escape. Right. Uh, you know, honestly, like, what would you say? Would you say this is like the, the majority not that like other we don't have clients in other stages, but I would say like most are in this phase where it's anywhere from about seven or three to about nine years. I mean, I know that's a big gap, like six years, but <laughs> roughly when we we have a lot of uh, our clients coming in because you know this is where the couple starts to carve out more definite space for themselves in the relationship. They might become more comfortable, they might start to pursue more individual pursuits and hobbies, and this might start to be a little bit uncomfortable given how much into each other they were previously. I don't know, did you see this at all? Like within your own marriage where you had to start being a little bit more okay with being your own person? Yeah, for sure. Um, and then for us, as a lot of kid, a lot of people, kids enter the picture too, you know, and then 
Um, if you got married earlier, then you're like more into full career mode. And so it feels like there's just added stresses and there's added responsibilities and demands. And it makes us have to really prioritize the relationship and it's easier for other things to become the priority. Um, I know a lot of women tend to express that like the kids take precedence and we hear that from a lot of men, you know, like my wife just is all about the kids right now. And I feel like I've been a little unseated. Um, and, and that is a generalization, but that can happen. Um, sometimes we hear that a lot of men, well, sometimes women too, but can tend to get really wrapped up in their careers and, um, you know, putting a lot of effort into quote unquote, getting there <laughs> and whatever getting there means. Right. But wanting to create financial stability. And that's when we get into a lot of fights about money. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of this, um, distraction and a lot of increased responsibility, a lot of increased stressors. And that's when, if we don't have that really solid foundation, we can tend to butt heads and make things pretty tense. It's exactly what you're saying. It's like between these two phases, like adjustment and like the seven year itch or great escape. Yeah. It's exactly that. It's like, you're starting to say, Hey, my husband or wife, my partner, isn't necessarily going to be the center of all my attention and how are we going to navigate this? Maybe I need to focus on my career or the kids a little bit. Maybe I want to do some things on my own or actually have some hobbies that aren't don't involve my spouse sometimes, occasionally. Uh, and this is so this is like a, a period where you're really adjusting and trying to like get in the groove of like how do we navigate being a couple versus all these other things that are going on in life. Yeah. Yep. And the escapism, like uh, the stress is too much. This responsibility is too much. My marriage is too tense. So then, yeah, we can tend to seek getting our needs met in other areas or other places. Um, but there's also a healthier aspect to this as well. So there's a healthy aspect of it's okay for me to have my own individual pursuits and hobbies. It's okay for me to take time for myself. Um, but then there's also that escapism in this great escape phase where you're trying to numb out or you're looking to get needs met in unhealthy ways. And that's when we really see a lot of challenges show up. I, I tend to see that if this is a problematic phase, that some amount of enmeshment or codependence has set in as in like they're relying a little bit too much on their partner for validation, happiness, worth, or, or so on and like so as focus starts to shift to other places either to kids or career or themselves a little bit to take care of their own needs and then there's like all this like anxiety and fear like oh no my my partner is not focusing on me then you know it, it starts to really show at, at, at this uh, part in the, the relationship and this is where we start to either you know, sometimes the couple can adjust by like saying, okay, no, 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 we need to like really lean on each other and we need to really, you know, I need to take care of you being anxious here and I'm going to, I'm going to appease you and they get more enmeshed or they start to like settle and like really carve out a healthy space for each different part of their life. Yeah. Agreed. I think another way of saying it that we talked about several weeks ago is like the drama triangle really shows itself. If you've got those codependencies and those different, things going on there with the drama and the tension, you really step into those roles and maybe one of you is trying to step out of those roles. That gets to the next stage or the next two stages after this one. <laughs> but uh, a lot of oftentimes in escapism is when affairs really happen. It's like, eh, not really sure. I want to keep putting a lot of work into this. Oh, look, here's this shiny new relationship that feels really fun and I can feel in love again and everything feels perfect over there. Um, rather than actually building the solid relationship on with the one you have. Yeah. So, yeah. So these, these couple phases here, they usually go, like I said, anywhere from about three to nine years or so. Uh, the, the next phase is more like the late first decade into the second decade, maybe into like, uh, you know, actually like right around the time we're in, you, uh, you're, you with your uh, husband, Ben, and me with my, my wife, Jennifer, uh, it's this reassessment phase. And it's like where things are, we're starting to 
become a little bit more adjusted to the other person's quirks. We're starting to mature, uh, especially if there's children involved because, you know, like it or not, children kind of force people to mature. <laughs> okay. uh, where they're starting to reestablish themselves as a couple. Like, so there's a little bit of like pulling away, hey, I can focus on some other things. And this today is just much more about like, okay, can I really carve out some space for the couple and really make family life good quality? Uh, this is also where I tend to see that uh, values are reevaluated. Um, I know it's at this stage. So I have like eight, or there's eight kids in my family. I, I'm the seventh of eight. And I would see in this stage uh, is when several of my siblings left the, the church that they were raised in. Because like this is a time where like, hey, what do I actually want in life? And what's, you know, what are my goals? What are my, what are my values? And what are our values as a family? Mm -hmm. uh, they start to kind of differentiate themselves much, much more from their family of origin. If, you know, if, if it's going, if this stage is going well. Su successful navigation is really about settling on new identities together as a family. And you would think this might be going on early, but like I think a lot of other things prevent you from really establishing your family identity up until this point. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, uh, me and my wife Jennifer at this stage, I'm going to make an assumption, you know, that we've been married similar amounts of times, Heather, that you and Ben are somewhat at this stage. Right? Yeah, similar. Um, you know, like we evaluated like our education beliefs and that's why we decided to unschool our kids and do kind of a really radical different thing than most people do because we found, hey, this is actually what our value is in this area, whereas before we were just going along with what everyone did, basically. Um, and so definitely like redefining what really matters to us and creating kind of our own family culture, right? Of like how to enhance our own family life with what matters most. I would just be really honest here. And I say there's definitely some of the, um, you know, we're still working through some of the drama triangle and some codependency, which came up this year. Yeah. And so that's why I'm so grateful to do this work and to have learned these things because then I can identify those patterns. And instead of just being a victim to them, we can say, hey, it's actually time to set down this whole, you know, hero, victim, persecutor role, <laughs> this whole dynamic here. And let's, what, what do we actually value? We actually value being unified and we value um, honesty and we value respect and we value creation, co-creation together. So let's put down those old patterns. I mean, we could keep them if we wanted to. We've done it for a really long time. It feels really comfortable. We're used to it, <laughs> but mm -hmm. we're deciding, no, we're going to put down some of those patterns now. And so, yeah, that's where we are. We're definitely in the, the identifying what our values are and even going into the growing together a little bit. There, there, is, there, there is that. I mean, like, if, if we're talking about, like, what are the stri strict lines here, the next stage would be about growing together. And, you know, yeah. you, you and your family, me and my, we're, we're fairly growth-oriented people. Yeah. So, like, this is, this is kind of throughout, but, you know, I think that it's a, a big part if you're deciding on values and saying, hey, I need to, you know, really grow is one of my things. I, I would say the growing together is much more common when the big responsibilities that came in during like that adjustment phase start to settle a bit more as in like the kids are getting older and your career is hitting its stride uh you know it's you start to be able to say hey there's a little bit more than just sticking my nose down to the grindstone and making sure i survived the next day a little bit uh and certainly that, that can come about like as kids stop being a bit more needy or you start getting a bit more support. I mean, the, these phases are a little bit fluid, I would say. Yeah. Uh, so I think that next stage is really an opportunity. Uh, I mean, well, let's actually go back to the reassessment stage. Where I see problems with that is people start to make those adjustments they start to redefine their values and they don't go together with their partner. Mm. Um, I will see it. I'm actually, you know, one of our close friends is 
questioning some of their beliefs, but their husband is sticking to a very, like, here are my values, these are the values I grew up with. And so, like, they're starting to come apart a little bit. It's, it's becoming, like, a big point of tension. Uh, but comments I'll hear when this is not going well is, like, we're growing apart. I've moved on. I've, I've grown, and they have not. Um, I've, re like, I've really thought about how I want to go forward in my life, and they're stuck in the past. You know, things like, things like that tend to happen in that reassessment phase. Uh, whereas it's different when you're having problems in that growing together phase because it's more like, hey, things are settling, and do we actually have a relationship? Can we actually move forward together positively? And like sometimes there's problems if there's like some dissatisfaction because you haven't focused on the the couple or you haven't carved out time as a couple. And now what do you have now that you're not having to focus on all these other stressors? Yeah, for sure. It's, so that's easy in that growing together, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. become satisfied if we just have what we feel like are just bare bones in the relationship. We're wanting something more, we're wanting a deeper connection and realizing that now that some of those stressors are removed, what do we really have here between just you and I? It's a huge transition stage. In fact, we get many, many, many empty nesters coming to us because they're like, okay, what do we do here? <laughs> or even just like when, as they were approaching the idea of being empty nesters, True. like the kids yeah. are now like in their teens and they're not needing babysitters. And why aren't we having dates? Yeah. Why aren't we actually spending time together? It's a big question at that phase. Yeah, agreed. And this then like starts to transition uh, into like that, here's the, the, that famed midlife crisis, midlife strife sort of phase. You know, I, I get it all the, all the time, Heather. You, I'm, and I'm sure you've seen the comments like, is my husband, is my wife just having a midlife yeah. crisis? Almost as yeah. if like that, that explains everything and yeah, that's, that's it. It's a little bit like the narcissism word that we talked about last week. It's just, you know, it makes it really just, let's just put a label on it and then maybe it removes some of the responsibility that we have and what's going on. Um, but the, it even, you know, MLC, the midlife crisis, it even has an acronym. So <laughs> what happens in the midlife crisis here that we see, Mark? So it's really what triggers this is starting to see some of the downhill journey. Like you're you're at hit, hitting midlife. Your kids are probably moving out. You've reached more or less perhaps a peak of your uh, your career, perhaps. But like you're saying, starting to see, oh, I actually have to plan towards retirement. I'm not young anymore. And a lot of like the effort here is tends to go towards dealing with that realization. Do we need, you know, do I need to go and capture that excitement while well, I'm still able to have some excitement in my life? Hey, I'm starting to get some back pain. Maybe I need to go do some rock climbing while I'm still able to actually do some rock climbing. Uh, maybe I need to go find this other woman while I'm still attractive to someone who is relatively young. Uh, and these are kind of the what goes on and why you might start seeing some of those older, you know, stereotypically older men dating younger women. It's it's because of this. I uh, and there may the the challenge then like they start we start to see some abandonment of marriage because time is limited. And they're not sure if they can get all those experiences, that excitement, that thrill that they found in youth within the marriage. That's They know the marriage. It's familiar. And they don't know how to navigate gaining some excitement there. We see a lot of people at this stage, don't we? Yes, we see a lot of people at this stage. So if you're there, you're not alone. Um, it is a huge time of transition and trying to figure things out. And like I mentioned earlier, most people do not have the skills to say, hey, I'm filling some needs here. They're not really getting met. And then they go about trying to get them met in very unhealthy and destructive ways. You know, whether that's a 
multiple affairs or it's just abandoning the family to go to Europe or travel the world. You know, oftentimes we relate it to the new car or the motorcycle, but what they're doing, what we do here is like we are hoping to get a feeling or hoping for some change, right? We want something drastic. So sometimes they just like buy something or go on a huge spending spree or a huge sex spree or whatever it is. And they, we feel like we're going to get something, the feeling that we want outside of us. And the bottom line is, is it never works because no matter how many new motorcycles you buy or how many new romantic partners you have, the feeling that you want is never out there. And eventually we get to the place, at least hopefully we get to the place. And even before we go into the midlife crisis, hopefully we get to the place where we realize it's actually all inside of us, that the feelings that we want are actually only found inside of us. And you don't need to go have an affair or buy something crazy expensive or go do something radical to get that feeling. It's a choice. And so, yeah, we see a lot of chaos in this stage when people are striving to get their needs met they're wanting some excitement. They're wanting things to change. Um, and so they go do unhealthy things. So what do you see here at this stage, Mark? I also see like as the partner trying to like maintain the relationship, um, one of the big problems that that person faces is the couple generally has settled into certain patterns. They, they've seen that, okay, we don't have this exciting partner, right? We don't communicate well, or, you know, like something is preventing needs from being adjusted. And this really leads to any sort of lack of confidence, trust, or hope that things could be different. So, you know, rather than try to address it within the relationship, they, the partner leaning out goes elsewhere because, well, Tom is going to be Tom or, uh, Sarah's going to be Sarah and you're like this is just what they know and this is that's the pattern like it's it's not it's not going to be resolved I and I do think that getting through that like what we're what I'm what I'm noticing just even as we have this conversation I'm seeing that a lot of times the problem isn't right there in that stage it's like failing to do one of the previous stages well, and then it builds up. So like you didn't really assess thing, reassess things really well. You didn't communicate well in the previous stage. You're probably going to see problems in the midlife crisis sort of stage. And it's all, there's always some lead up to these sort of things. You know, if you don't accomplish previous stages well, this is also why, you know, we tend to not see a lot of couples in the honeymoon phase because there's not, <laughs> not a lot of ways to fail things before that, if yeah. you're going to get to a point where you're getting married. <laughs> Agreed. So we got a good comment here. Um, this is this is where we are and has not been good. And so again, if you're in the stage, then you're not alone. This is also a stage where you guys both realize typically you're old enough and have enough life experience to be like, okay, what we're doing is not working. Neither of us are happy here. And I realized that I just really haven't figured things out. I thought I would be at a certain place in my life by now, and I'm not. So I'm ready to do something different about it. <laughs> um, on a neuro, neurological level, which Mark and I study some um, neuroscience and psychology, of course, and human development, all that thing, is that by the time we're 35 years old, 90% of who we are is a set of wired programs and hardwired beliefs. And eventually, sometimes we just wake up one day and we're like, enough of it. I never thought I would be here. I thought I'd be a lot happier that we'd be so much more happy in our relationship. And now things are just blah and we're constantly criticizing each other or we're totally checked out or whatever the unhealthy pattern is. And you don't feel like you have any hope to change it. So then you're just like, forget it. I'm just going to go do something wild and crazy. And then you realize that actually didn't resolve it either. So the healthier way to handle these things is like Mark said, um, you know, being aware of earlier stages when you can and navigate those successfully. And we do help people in those stages. And like Mark and I said, that's kind of where we are in our personal marriages or in some of those earlier stages of redefining our values and creating a life together, growing together rather than growing apart. So that then, you know, if we ever wake up one day and we're like, what is happening? <laughs> I don't really want to keep doing things in the same way. That can actually be a beautiful gift 
when you can say, I don't want to keep doing all the same things in the same way. I'm ready to do things in a new way and move towards becoming the person I really meant to be, the healthier, better version of myself. Um, and so that is what we can help you guys navigate because it is it is challenging. There's a lot of trickiness to this, but it is absolutely possible. So Mark, after the midlife strife crisis stage, it what tends, happens? yeah, it tends to, you know, if couples get past that, for the most part, they're they're probably good good for the rest of their life. <laughs> like it, it's after like a midlife crisis, they the couple tends to settle into this idea that they're going to be together for the rest of their life. Um, tends to be a higher ability to withstand ups and downs as they're maybe navigating, say, more health concerns or, you know, loss of loved ones or just separation from children, grandchildren. Uh, you mentioned there, you, you spoke with a, uh, a woman who's <laughs> a little bit older, like in her 80s. I'll be honest, we don't tend to see a lot of people in the stage. If there are problems, it, it's exactly what that, that woman was explaining. It's like they've become so comfortable. So, so comfortable. yeah, so comfortable. That that's that becomes the problem. It's yeah. like very little ability to adjust or to address issues because they've already settled into so many patterns and there's less willingness or less ability perhaps to make big adjustments. And that's, but like for the most part, if you can make it past those other phases, you know, fulfillment stage is what it's called um, by some. It's, it has some other names, other places, but it's really, you know, it's like, hey, we're going to be together. Let's actually be happy. You know, that's like the successful way to, to go about that and say, hey, you know, there's some changes going on, but uh, we got each other. And that's really like going through that and being successful. Yeah, which is, you know, the sweet little old couple sitting on the park bench holding hands, not even talking, but just content to be together, which is beautiful. <laughs> so, Mark, what do each of these stages have in common? We went in really depth into these. As you're listening, do a check-in. See which one you're actually at and what the common challenges, the common mistakes are that most people make in those stages, and then what the actual goal is that you want to create no matter where you are, um, making sure that you get the right skills and the right support to help you get there. Um, but what did these stages each have in common? So you'll notice, if you're paying attention, each stage is a big shift in expectations mm -hmm. and a perhaps a different priority uh, of needs. Um, the thing is, the outside responsibilities or stressors shift, and so then expectations uh, need to shift like big big outside responsibilities that have a big impact on these stages kids career aging body uh, You know like these these sort of things have a big impact on how you are looking at life mm -hmm. uh, But really, you know, like there's a lot like it could be anything and Really it boils down to like are there are there shifts in in expectations we see this on like a micro level as couples try to navigate, say, something like the idea of separation. Mm -hmm. uh, they're saying, hey, there's some big problems. Maybe let's just like live apart or have a little bit of space for a little bit. This is a very common issue that we, we deal with the clients. Like the partner pulling away is like, I'm not happy. I need to figure things out. I'm going to move over here. And what tends to happen is the expectations about the relationship on this micro level have a drastic shift. They're like, we're not gonna spend as much time together, I need some space, I need to figure things out. It's this big shift, and then what happens? There's a high amount of tension. These other like more traditional stages are very much about like these gradual shift in expectations. Uh, like even something like the honeymoon phase, it's a big shift to go from like, we're not like, we're, we're we're into each other, but now we're like really into each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and, or like, you know, now we have, now that we're into each other, now we have to deal with some stressors. What do we do about that? And are the expectations changing? So that's like 
really what it's about, your needs shift. There might be higher needs for growth or connection or excitement at different times. As a professional, like where I go to like make sense of all this, I really like having as a foundation, uh, sometimes we'll talk about this, but the, the person who put forth this idea was Chloe Madonna's, who works with, uh, I, I believe it's Tony Robbins, right? It's the Madonna's Robbins Institute of Corporation, or I'm not sure whose name is first in there, but uh, it's she talks about six basic emotional needs. And like basically a lot of these uh, stages, you could come at it from that lens as in what needs are being prioritized at these different moments and what expectations are shifting at these different stages in life. I look at it as these are points, uh, they're, they're opportunities that you can either take these challenges, these stages, and it can help you as a couple grow together, or it taxes the, the relationship and you start pulling apart based on how you approach each of these stages. Really, Heather, what does it come down to? There's like basically, you know, two options when you approach each of these stages. What do you think? I, I personally, yeah, yeah, we can either pull together, right? We can grow closer together, or we can go further apart, depending yeah. on how we navigate these things. And I like to ask you guys, as you're listening, are you currently growing together, or are you pulling apart at this stage? And is that what you really want? I think it's a little bit about like, yeah, absolutely pulling together. But I also think like a bit of this is, is there resistance to these shifts? Hmm. And certainly if there's a lot of resistance, this is where we get problems. Like if you think about it, reassessment phase. Let's pretend like Heather, you're saying, hey, I want to question some of the values that we had growing up and I want to make our own family culture. And if Ben was coming at it like, no, this is who we are. Why would you even want to question this? What's going to happen right there? Absolute division. Resistance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, or if like you get to this uh, individuation, great escape, seven year itch sort of phase and someone's like, hey, maybe I want to focus a little bit on like some me time. Maybe I want to like mm -hmm. take a little bit of time for the, the kids. Maybe, maybe I want to, you know, also have time for the, the relationship, but you know, I want to focus on these other things and your partner's like, no, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in each of these, it's like, is there resistance to some of these natural needs at these stages? And I think that's where a lot of the division comes from. Yeah. So then what is needed here, Mark, to navigate each stage of the marriage? Because we've seen that there's a lot of really common mistakes that people make. We talked about the drama triangle. We talked about looking to get needs met in unhealthy ways. Talked about looking to outside things to make us feel better thinking that something outside me, me needs to change, my partner needs to change for me to feel better. Um, and, and, you know, even just the complacency. I mean, there's so many different things here. So what's really needed to successfully navigate these stages? Well, honestly, I think there's some ability to stumble through some of these stages. Yeah. But I, I don't like to rely on that. No. What, I, what I want to observe here is that the couples that do stumble through um, are the couples that tend to start off with more things in common, as in they they have very similar backgrounds, very similar religious beliefs, very similar values. <clears throat> and this is also why, interesting thing, this is also why there are greater rates of divorce when you have very different backgrounds, religious beliefs, values. <laughs> Because it makes it so that you can't stumble through these stages and kind of get by a little bit. It makes it harder to do that. But so then let's say that you do have some of those things stacked against you. Maybe, you know, maybe one of you grew up Jewish and the other was a devout Christian. Like you have a, honestly, you have a little bit more stacked against that relationship, but there's ability to, to navigate this. And my opinion is that it's about high amounts of transparency, communication, agreement of expectations. You mentioned the the drama triangle that we were discussing the other week. What was that about? It was about like, do we have clear agreements? Do we have clear communication? Do we have clear expectations? 
Uh, and I do think that a lot of that is needed if you are going to, instead of like resisting change and, you know, stumbling on some of these stages, it tends to make it so that you grow stronger together. I actually personally believe that if you have more challenges, you have more differences, and you work through it well, that's a stronger, it's a stronger marriage. Absolutely. So, like, I do think that this happens a lot more, like I said, when couples are a bit more in sync, they have greater amounts of similar goals, values, interests, they can absolutely achieve that if they're like really conscious about like, okay, let's actually talk about this. Let's negotiate a bit. Let's discuss this. Let's make this a partnership. Let's like actually figure it out together. That's like the hallmark of how to, like the, the, it's the hallmark of the, the, the healthy couple navigating these stages. I don't know, Heather, like what do you think uh, I mean, what's been your experience navigating some of these stages? Have you noticed anything? Have you seen how you and Ben have approached this? I mean, I certainly have. I could tell many stories. I have, obviously, we haven't gotten to like some of the later stages, but I could see a lot of, you know, just what we talked about today in my marriage with, with Jen. What about you? <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to share something. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I, 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 was asking, no. I was asking you a question. I, I feel like I've talked for a bit. I want to want to hear from you. <laughs> yeah, I feel like having awareness is huge, and more often than not, we just don't know. Like, I didn't know about these different stages of marriage, and I didn't know about the drama triangle and all this stuff. And what happens is that we get threatened by each other or upset with each other, and then we get out our weapons and we're, you know, <laughs> like in the boxing ring, sparring with our partner and instead of working together as a team. And so it feels like, you know, sometimes I'm on one side of the table and Ben's on the other side of the table and we're like at each other instead of both of us getting on the same side of the table being against the issue. And what definitely helped was exactly what we teach here. And it's understanding our partner's perspective. It's truly seeking to understand them. Um, and then making adjustments where needed and having those clear communication, the clear requests of saying, at this time in my life, I'm feeling this and this is what I feel like I need. And at this time in your life, you're feeling this, is this is what you feel you need. How can we work together as a team to do that so that we both feel good about this? And that that takes some skill, but it's definitely something that we can learn. and. We did not do it great in the back, you know, in the past. And I think we had, you know, we kind of stumbled through some of those stages, but we look back on them and they were rough. Like you look back on the rough years of your marriage, it's probably because you stumbled through one of these relation, you know, relationship phases and you got through it, but did you really grow through it? When we grow through it, like Mark said, then we become so much better and so much stronger together um, and have that deeper level of connection and trust and intimacy. But the bottom line is that each of these shifts, when we have a different change in our expectation, we need to have communication because things do change and we need to be able to communicate that to ourselves and have that awareness about what I'm really feeling and why, what's really driving this, and then be able to communicate honestly and openly with our, with our spouse, which we talked a lot about the last two weeks with being able to talk about anything and be loved and accepted. Um, you know, as said, as individuals, we're not the same person we were 10 years ago. I know I'm not. Mark, are you the same person you were 10 years ago? When I look at myself like 10 years ago, it, it seems like that's a strange, it's, it's a stranger to me at this point. Yeah. Right. We're, we're all very right. different. So within our marriage, we're like one and a half new people because <laughs> we've been married 16 years. So yeah, our wants, our needs, our desires, and our expectations change over time, and your partner's gonna change over time. Sometimes we say, my spouse isn't the same person as when we got married. And you're right, you're not. Oh, and I, you're I'm like even <laughs> thinking about that, Heather. I'm like, I'm thinking about who I was when I was first married 16 years ago. And I'm looking back at that, I'm like, man, I made so many dumb decisions back then and I was I was so immature back then I was like, yeah very very different sort of stage of life yeah 
the bottom line is we don't have to just fall out of love or say we're no longer compatible or we just grew apart. Those are choices. And so you can let life and these different stages choose for you if you don't navigate it correctly. Or you can decide, hey, this relationship matters to me and I want to become a better person. And I don't want to just give up and be a victim to this circumstance. I'm going to choose to be a creator here and learn how to work together with my spouse so that we can become better and stronger together. Um, and yeah, it's, again, we, we talk about we're not mind readers, right? As much as we'd love to read our spouse's mind, we don't always know everything going on inside their head or their heart. Um, this week has been illuminating to me again about what Ben was actually going through. And I was like, okay, we're at a stage right now where I'm in like growth mode and he's still saying, hanging on to some of the trauma from cancer and stuff. And, and we are where we are. And so I can't just assume that he's with me and like, let's conquer the world, baby. And, you know, nor can he assume that I understand and have absolute empathy that he's still struggling with some things there. No, we need to communicate these things and have that open discussion and, and understanding for each other. That's how we really navigate it. And that's what we help couples do because it's not things that are normally really easy to figure out on your own. It really does take some outside perspective to uncover what's going on. So yeah, Mark, any final thoughts about how to navigate these stages successfully? Yeah, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm looking back on like how Jennifer and I did this ourselves. And certainly as I'm looking back, I can see these different phases where perhaps, you know, I was focused on grad school and work and like we really had to navigate, okay, well, what happens when we're not 100% focused on each other. That was like a, a big point in our relationship. And I, you know, even further, like right now or these last several years as Jen and I have been like figuring out what are our values, I, we've certainly stumbled a little bit here and there, but like I'm looking back on a lot of these things and say, hey, actually I grew closer to my wife during those phases. And I think a big part of this is because even though we stumbled a bit, we took those moments and we decided to to really sit down, figure it out, communicate, and like work with each other uh, through some of those challenges. And then even through some of those po periods where we had a greater ability to grow together, we're like, okay, well, how do we want to build up our relationship further? I like we're in a kind of phase like that right now where we're, Jen and I are like, what do we want to be as a couple? Let's let's decide on this and like let's make this the best thing that we possibly can. But yeah, I, I like your points there. I, it is very very much about can you communicate that? Can you like um, can you be open with your partner about some of your struggles? Can you be open with them about what you want in life? And I think those are the the ones that end up growing and being much more healthy is the, the couples that are able to navigate it like that. Yeah. And that's why we call this, you know, high thrive coaching, the thriving marriage. It's not just about surviving stages. It's not just about a getting through them, but it is about growing through them and truly learning how to thrive. That is the beauty that, that life gives us. So, you know, at this point you might be feeling, you know, like, wow, that sounds really hard talked about doing a lot of really hard stuff. And right now, maybe my spouse isn't wanting to do it with me. So it kind of feels like it's all on me. And I don't know if I can do it. Um, bottom line is, I might not be able to change my spouse. I can't change them. They still might leave me if I do this. They still might have an affair. They still might have a midlife crisis and go to Timbuktu with who knows who. <laughs> they might disconnect from me. You know, we might fall out of love. I might still get hurt. It's just going to take too much time. You know, I just don't know what to do. I'm so overwhelmed, blah, 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 right? All of that. You might be feeling any of those things. And so that's why Mark and I, we've created a really simple process to follow. And it works. And we've used it now with, like I said, tens of thousands of students. And it helps you to have a secure and happy marriage, you know, in several months or less, depending on your situation. We typically see six to 12 months to have that kind of relationship. And that works even if your spouse is not on board right now. So if you're saying they're not willing to do it with me, I can't control them. Well, you're right. But this still works, even if they're not willing to do it with you right now. And you can do it on your own, even if you doubt yourself, because most of our clients have felt that way. And we're here to help make sure that you succeed. So 
if that sounds like something you would like to pursue some more, uh, we have a few spots open on the calendar this week, just a few. We are actually really, really booked up. We have only a few spots open. But if you're yeah. serious about having the marriage that you want, you know, in six months, 12 months, a couple of years from now or less, then I encourage you to book a free breakthrough session with us and talk to our coaches at highthrivecoaching.com slash apply. And again, we only have a few spots left. If they're already booked, then I'm sorry. You'll have to try again. Uh, we do tend to fill up really quickly, but that's highthrivecoaching.com slash apply. I'll put that over in the uh, comments here. Um, I love Tracy's question. So that would be a great one to bring to the coaches and hopefully we have some spots open. All right, we've gone a little long. Mark, do you want to save our myth, marriage myth buster for next time? Or but, do you want to run with it? My, I mean, we're, we're right on the hour mark. I think that's... Uh... All right. Sounds good. Then our marriage myth buster <laughs> is marriage is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> Which I think is kind of funny because we just talked about like all these different stages and how things change and expectations change and we're always growing and we're not the same person. But, it's, yeah, it's kind of an interesting one. So, Mark, where do you think this saying really came from? Well, I mean, if anyone's heard this phrase, I mean, you've seen the movie. This is from, you know, Forrest Gump, that, that saying. Life and we, yeah, yeah, life is like a box of chocolate. But then people start applying this elsewhere. But, like, I'm, I was, I, okay, I'm going to be honest. When we prepare for these things, we do have an assistant that looks through comments, looks through some things and pulls some of these ideas out. And that's why I'll admit, like when I, when I sat down to like prepare for today, I was like, where, where did this come from? Where did this come from? Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, like, uh, like I said, we take the, these sort of things from the comments that we see on our Facebook page. We take it from, you know, our, the audience, we take it from random things that we see while researching. And these are like things that people will actually say. And, you know, typically when we decide like what we're going to talk about in, in this segment, it's like things that we've seen at least several times. And I get I, I get the sentimentality. It, it's it's nice to say, you know, it's it's nice to haha, like here's this connection to this movie that I'm not even like at this point it's it's probably a little bit less relevant. How old is that movie now, Heather? It's like what, early two oh, thousand? I don't, is I think it's 90s, maybe? Is yeah, it, is it, uh, yeah wow. I remember watching it as a young middle schooler, so, yeah. Oh, <laughs> is it really that old? Uh, you know, I think you're right. Like, now, Tom Hanks is young. Yeah, <laughs> this is exactly what we were talking about earlier. Like, you know, we're getting at this point where, like, how long have I been married? And, like, my wife and I were having a comment or uh, just a discussion the other day. Like, you know, looking back at some of the things from like the late '90s, or early 2000s, and it's like, no, that that was just like five or ten years ago, right? No, no, that's even close to 20 years ago now. Yeah, exactly. Um, but like, <laughs> here's the thing: this this sort of sentiment, sentiment, it can can be true. There's lots of surprises, unexpected challenges, exactly what we talked about today. Uh, surprises really can't be avoided. Things are going to happen. I. Uh, Part of the reason why I got into really diving deep into relationships, um, I really wanted my own my own uh, relationships, my own marriage with my wife to to go well. Uh, and what I found is that there's a lot of, you know, while there are going to be surprises, there's always going to be bumps. There are a lot of things that you can anticipate and predict. <laughs> you know. We could even go back to the analogy of the chocolates, like, hey, yeah, life's like a box of chocolates, but, you know, sometimes there's some guides that tell you kind of, you know, roughly what you're going to get. <laughs> and it's not that you can predict the future, but, you know, truth is lots of people, Heather, have gone down this road over thousands of years. There's probably been billions and billions of couples that have navigated this. And, you know, we've learned a little bit about how people interact over the especially over the last hundred years or so mm -hmm. um, and couples can learn if they really want to about some of these challenges and predict some expected bumps in the road um, to, in order to better prepare most people won't but you know it's out there you could 
<laughs> Most people are going to look at this uh, when they they are in the middle of those challenges and those bumps. And you know, I get it. There's a lot of other things to focus in on life. Uh, my opinion, you know, mostly listen to what Heather and I talk about. You'll you'll probably be pretty good. <laughs> you'll probably be mostly fine. Um, but you know, if you do find yourself in the middle of those struggles and you're like, I don't have any idea how I got here. I don't know what to do now. You know, Heather is talking about talking with us. Always an option, people. We, I like to think that we know a little bit what we're talking about, right, Heather? I, I think, <laughs> yeah, I, I think we we got some ideas here. Uh, so you know, yeah, like it, it's understandable if you haven't focused on this yourself and you need a little support. That's exactly what we're here for. So yeah. yes, life or uh, marriage is like a box of chocolates, but there's some people that are pretty smart out there that kind of know what's in the chocolate box. They can help you. All they right. Thank you, Mark. So next week we're going to talk about four secrets to a healthy marriage in less than six months, even if your spouse is checked out. That's a pretty bold claim, but Mark and I can back it up because we've done it. And we're going to share with you exactly what that looks like. So Stay tuned for that next week. And thank you all for joining us today. Our, we appreciate you and we look forward to talking soon. Thanks for listening to The Thriving Marriage, your A to Z blueprint for not just surviving marriage, but thriving. Until next time, my friends, thrive on.